Hi, Chris Potts here. Let's talk English noun compounds and compositionality. The focus of our discussion will be this recent paper by a bunch of Stanford linguists. Uh, Beth Levine and Dan Jurafsky are faculty members in our department, and Lelia Glass was a PhD student in our department, actually jointly advised by Beth and me. And Lelia is now a professor in linguistics at Georgia Tech. The paper is called Systematicity and the Semantics of Noun Compounds, the Role of Artifacts versus Natural Kinds. My goal for the current screencast is to set the stage a bit for this paper. We want to ask, what big questions is the article asking? What kinds of noun compounds are they studying? And what methods of investigation do they employ? And then in subsequent screencasts, we'll look closely at their hypotheses, experiments, and findings. And we'll also look at what happened in our own small informal comprehension experiment that built on their ideas and materials. Now, I have a few personal motivations for focusing on this paper and this topic. The first is that it will give us a chance to look more, more closely at lexical meanings. So already you could see in our unit on adjectives that our treatment of open domain lexical items like nouns and adjectives can be pretty cursory. We say they denote sets of entities and the like. Uh, we don't go much deeper than that. Now, for the most part, we're doing that because we want to focus on the core truth conditions and the compositional details. Um, with this discussion of compounds, we get to go a layer deeper, and that feels good. Of course, there's a separate course at Stanford specifically for lexical semantics, and we won't go nearly as deep or as far as they do. But this at least shows that there are important and interesting connections to be had between what we're doing and what happens under the rubric of lexical semantics. Even more important to me is this second big goal. We want to ask whether adhering to the compositionality principle might have a dark side, right? Is this principle leading us astray? Should we be adjusting how it's stated and what it means to us? And finally, I just want to highlight that this article is innovative in its experimental methods. We'll see that Levine, Glass, and Jurafsky bring together a lot of different empirical methods, corpus studies, production experiments, and interpretation experiments. So this mixes observational methods with careful laboratory manipulation in a way that yields a really rich picture of how noun compounds in English work. And they're doing this in the service of addressing really big general questions about language and human cognition. And I also love that the paper is so open in the sense of open science, right? If you follow this link here, you can find their corpus materials and their experimental materials and results and so forth. So this resource is just out here waiting to be used to define lots of exciting and interesting follow-up studies. Okay, let's move now to section two, the basics of English compounds. This will help us get a feel for the nature of the phenomena we'll be studying. The first distinction to observe relates to the default stress pattern for noun compounds as compared to regular attributive adjective constructions. Uh, this table of examples is adapted from our Partee 1995 reading. And Partee observes, for example, that a toy store with focus on store is probably a child's toy, something that depicts a store, perhaps. That's the modifier head construction. By contrast, a toy store is a real life store that sells toys. Uh, similarly, a brick factory is a factory that is made of bricks. It could manufacture bicycles or the like. Whereas the compound brick factory is a factory that makes bricks. The building itself needn't use bricks in any way in its construction, right? And a brick brick factory would presumably be a factory whose building is made of bricks and which manufactures bricks. Um, a white house is a house painted white whereas the White House is where the U.S. president lives. It needn't be painted white. I mean, it happens to be white, and that's, of course, part of the historical origin of the name. But if it were repainted blue or something, we would still refer to it as the White House, I think. And so forth. I think, you know, so a black bird is one that's black, whereas a blackbird is a species of bird. And indeed, some variants of these blackbirds don't seem to be black in color at all. What we're seeing already is that in modifier head constructions, the modifier truly behaves like an adjective, whereas the modifier doesn't behave that way for a compound. The next test brings this out even more directly. If we modify these constructions with adverbs like really or light, then only the modifier head reading is truly available, right? So a really white house is a house that's really strongly colored white or something. There's no reading of this where really is modifying the president's home, the White House. 
Uh, a light blue bird is a bird whose feathers are light blue, presumably. It's blue that's modified here. Now, there is a reading of this light where it modifies bluebird as a compound, but that's not one where light modifies blue, right? That's a case where light modifies the entire compound, and so it probably means something like a bluebird that is light in terms of its weight, right? Uh, this next test gets at something similar. In contrastive environments, you get a stress pattern that departs actually from what we saw in one, in that the modifier will receive some stress if it's the point of contrast. For example, in 3a, we have two modifier head phrases, and the sentence contrasts their adjectives, right? Blackbirds are rarer than blue ones. But you can't mix modifiers and compounds in this way. So in 3b, the intention is to try to use a compound, blackbirds, but have the modifier contrast with green in the second phrase in what's unambiguously a modifier head construction because it uses one anaphorically to convey birds. And this seems very marked. I've even gone ahead and put an asterisk on this example, which is the symbol that linguists use for examples that seem fundamentally ill-formed in terms of their structure or interpretation. Now, I bet you do see and hear people doing things like this, but I think it's kind of like a little language game. That's the sense I get, for example, 3C, the president lives in the White House and Mark Twain lived in the brown one. If someone said that, I think they would be playing with the language a bit by acting as if white and brown were in contrast in the relevant way. So I've used the hatch mark here as the linguist symbol for an example that's syntactically well-formed but problematic somehow in terms of its meaning or usage. That might be more appropriate for 3b2, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I would just say the important thing is that the, there's a clear intuition that the examples are unusual, and we can trace that to the fact that compounds are not true modification structures. The final contrast I want to review concerns our old friend entailment. I've already touched on this, but let's make it concrete. For compounds, the modifier is not necessarily entailed. In 4a, we see that the compound blackbird doesn't entail that the entity is black. Maybe there are even some green blackbirds. But in 4b, that black bird is completely orange seems odd. It seems to contradict itself, or at the very least, it entails both that the bird is black and that it's completely orange, and I'm not sure what that bird would look like. Okay, let's move to section three, part T, 1995 on compounds and compositionality. We now have a sense for what non noun compounds are like, and we now turn to the juicy theoretical question that compounds raise. What do they tell us about compositionality? Recall that compositionality says the meaning of a whole is a function of the meanings of the parts and of the way they are syntactically combined. In other words, the meaning of the whole phrase is determined by, that is fully predicted by, the meanings of its constituent parts. So what about compounds? Well, Partee gives a direct answer here. She first talks about how modifier head constructions are compositional, and then she writes, in compounds, on the other hand, there is no general rule for predicting the interpretation of the combination. A toy store, in typical context, is a store that sells toys. A toy box is a box that holds toys, and so on. Semanticists in general do not expect a semantic theory to provide a compositional semantics for compounds, but do expect a compositional semantics for modifier head constructions. The reasoning is that a native speaker cannot, in general, interpret a novel compound on first hearing on the basis of knowledge of the language alone, but can do so for a novel modifier noun construction. Very interesting. Now, I do feel compelled here to insert a quick aside, right? How predictable are modifier noun constructions really? Take the case of flat in seven. So a flat surface is one that's even somehow. A flat tire, though, is one that lacks air. And a flat note is one with some acoustic properties that make it sound off key. And a flat beer is one that has lost its fizziness. Well, these all seem related in some broad metaphorical sense. It seems too much to say that we can predict what the whole thing means from the parts, right? Take 7e, flat file. I think this is a pretty new coinage. If you're hearing it for the first time now, do you know what it means? It refers to a computer file without hierarchical structure, say one that lists plain text only, no database format or anything like that. 
Could you have predicted that from knowing about 7a through 7e? I kind of think not. So the takeaway here is that in truth, there might be some overlap between compounds and modifier structures with some modifiers having some of the properties of compounds in terms of how we figure out their meanings. That area is ripe for further exploration, and I think our discussion of Levine et al.'s compounding work could inform such studies. For now, though, let's agree that our focus is on the degree to which compounds are predictable and on what the answer means for the status of the compositionality principle. So this means we needn't worry too much about our friend flat in seven. I think eight nicely summarizes the technical issue before us. In 8a, we have a true modifier structure. There are two parts, and we know what our job is as compositional semanticists. Give a meaning to white, a meaning to house, and explain how those two meanings combine to predict the meaning for white house. For compounds, if we adopt compositionality in Parsti's assertion in six, we have to say that they're just lexical items. We can't break this down into pieces as we did in 8a, because then we have to do the compositional thing, and Parti just told us that that can't be done. To put this another way, and recalling Parti's observations about how syntax and semantics work together for these things, if the syntacticians say that compounds have syntactic structure, as in 8a, then this poses a dilemma for us, since compositionality would compel us to give meanings to the subparts and predictably derive the meanings for the whole. But Parti just said that that can't be done, right? That's what she said in six. So that's the background. In the next screencast, we'll look at what Levine, Glass, and Jurafsky have to say about all this. In a nutshell, they'll present evidence that compounds, while perhaps not fully compositional, have meanings that are systematic and predictable in a broad sense from the parts.